The final one is um, called Starting New Families, which is really a, a little bit of a whistle stop uh, regarding uh, church, uh, church planting. Uh, so I'm just having a look here at my timings. Yep. Yeah, okay, just to figure out how long I've got with that one. Right, just a few things. Well, first to say church planting, I think, again, is something that should naturally happen as a result of sharing the gospel so it's inherent in the great commission matthew 28 disciples shared their faith and then they instinctively planted churches around uh, gathering the, the people who come to know christ into groups they then helped them get established they helped appoint leaderships and then they moved on and so um no one told them to do that. The Lord, you know, Jesus didn't say plant churches. He said, make disciples, teach, make disciples. They instinctively did it because they thought, saw that that was the best way of gathering um, people who knew the Lord together to grow and to then replicate uh, in their own context. So, so church, church planting, therefore, is an instinctive, healthy outworking of biblical mission is the point. Uh, and the context in which the Christian life is lived out and where and from where mission is multiplied. So mission should be multiplied from a church to producing more churches. And individuals, as, whether we're called to feel called to be involved in a church plant uh, individually is, is irrelevant. We should all be involved in the mission of church planting, so sharing the gospel and church planting, whether or not we we go or not um the vision is for people to be saved and added now right, church planting then takes place on the foundation of biblical values so when we plant a church for example we have a certain uh value system biblical teaching practice that we put in place we we try to lay that foundation into the ch local church we're planting so that when the, the church then grows, it grows upon values and principles and beliefs that we've put in place that are our ways. You know, Paul talked about, you know, being a wise master builder. He talked about um, putting in a foundation. He talked about, you know, the church growing on a foundation um, that, that he put in. And so there has to be a, a founding um process going on because as over time the church then grows it, the foundations are the thing that determine the shape now values are not the same as style and it's important to say that you can have a church that's built on you can have say 10 churches all built on the same values which might be i don't know well never mind what they are at the moment built on the same biblical values but the style might vary according to the the cultural context whether it's a city or a, a village, whether it's, uh, um, yeah, a whole, a whole range of things, what, what, what kind of makeup of the church is, the style of the church might, might be very different. And that's, that's good, but you should be able to see the same values everywhere. Now, values might be things like, you know, belief in the authority of scripture and good expository preaching and believing in, you know, doctrine and training and teaching well mixed with um, wanting to see the manifest presence of God through the Holy Spirit, doing the different things that the Holy Spirit does in the lives of individuals, word and spirit together. We might want to have a foundation of the grace of God. So we teach the grace of God as a, as a foundation for our righteousness in Christ and our belief and practice rather than legalism or anything like that. We might have worship, prayer, giving, sharing our faith we might have all sorts of values that we put in right at the beginning that from whom the building then take takes shape um so we wanted to make a diligent attempt at putting new testament foundation into all the churches we plant doesn't mean we get everything right but we want to make sure that we really put a lot of effort into the values and the foundations because that does determine how how mature and safe and steady the building is so that means particularly we try to emphasize what we call supply lines so if we plant a church in another nation or geographical distance from um any anything else we've got we want to make sure that we send in 
a regular supply of translocal ministries to help equip and stand with and encourage and support that church and put foundations in and strengthen them uh, so that church is well supported well well supplied it, the idea of missionaries going to a far off land being sent by a sending church even being financially resourced by a sending church and then have nothing to do with them relationally or visits or supply lines or it, it, that just doesn't I don't think that's biblical and I don't it doesn't work it just leaves people very lonely at the end of a newsletter uh, and I don't think that's that's the way forward so we we try to put in supply lines as part of um, the way forward most important we don't want to create a dependency culture financially so we want to try and create perhaps some business some 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 way of self-financing for people who are pioneering and planting um it's rare that you need a full-time ministry at the beginning of a, of, a, of a church plant so you want someone who's got some transferable business skill particularly if you're going to a pioneering situation um so we talk about like a Romans 16 list that Paul has of his fellow workers where he commends them for their service of the churches. So he would send people all over the place, his supply lines to all the family of churches he had. He'd make sure that churches were served by relevant ministries and relational connections so that they always felt part of a family rather than jettisoned and left to just stand or fall on their own. Now, church planting can obviously uh, take different phases. We like to talk about forming gospel communities first rather than planting a church, because if you've got just a, I don't know, a couple who've moved because perhaps their business has taken them somewhere and they think, well, we're here for work. We can't find a church we really feel um, is, is, is our values. So we're happy to share the gospel and be a little gospel community, just have people coming to our home we don't call that a church plant yet because that would become a bit too much of a pressure on people to try and make it sound more than it is but it can then move to a church plant uh, as it gets perhaps a little bit of momentum we might want to send a whole group of people somewhere as a church plant I don't know a dozen to 20 people really taking responsibility for somewhere that as a group of churches we've all we've recruited amongst ourselves and sent people to do it some churches are do do a multi multi-site model from their own city or whatever where they've got several congregations around the, the city incarnating as it were in different um uh, in different uh, neighborhoods and communities uh, and that can be another you know effective way each phase will be marked with a different kind of oversight and a different kind of supply line and a different kind of um, gift mix to help that, uh, that church plant flourish. I think the best church planting is simple and relational and accountable. So it shouldn't involve, it, it shouldn't feel like extending a brand uh, or a denomination or having targets and making people feel they've got to, you know, um, attain certain things by a certain length of time in order to get their next quota of money now i hear stories of that sort of thing and i i think that's most unhelpful because often there are we've had church plants where circumstances have changed in a situation that and have made a certain season very adverse to fruitfulness but you stick with people and you say right okay let's we'll see this through together and then you'll find sometimes that it'll just change and, and the, the wind blows in a fairer direction and things start to move. So you're in it together. Um, we, we try to have this um, philosophy as well, that uh, if, if someone has a success, we will applaud them. Uh, and if someone hits upon hard times and it goes a bit wrong, we take the hit together. It's our um, hit, it's our failure, it's our... Um, issued that it's gone wrong not not the individuals um, we, we really try to make sure that we you know create a culture where people are willing to take some risks and then if the risks well-intentioned obedient godly risks for different reasons don't always work out then we take that together and we stand together in that and we applaud people's obedience we applaud their faith we're not looking for numbers on a piece of paper now 
having said that, I think if we create that culture, people feel much more free to have a go. And as a result, I think you get more fruitfulness because people don't feel the pressure of trying to achieve targets, that sort of thing. I think we, and it can be simple. We don't have to have a great big pantechnic and truck turns up with a full worship band and a, you know, a stage and PA and chairs and like three people sitting there with about 50 chairs or whatever. Don't need to do that. You know, I've found the best church plants, church plants grow best with one simple ingredient, food. Some of the best ones I've seen are where after whatever gathering they have, people just bring their food. If it's a particularly multicultural church, bring different food from the nations. People feel an ownership. They feel this is, you know, my church because it eats my food. Simple things like that can really just help the relational dynamics get going and people just love coming. Uh, so it, it's, you know, it's, it's making it relationally attractive to people and feel they belong. They're not going to an event. They're coming to a family, a group of friends that love Christ. Um, interestingly, as we sort of reflect on the pandemic, I'm hearing lots of people saying things like, should we go back to big church or should we go to small church now? Do we go back to how it was? Do we do something different? Well, my, my reflection on that would be, if we start something small, if it's good, it will become big anyway. And then you have the same problem. When we planted our church 30 plus years ago, it was a living room of people, just a small group of people in a house. And God blessed it and it grew. And when it grew, it changed. And you then have to plant more churches in order to, um, you know, uh, keep keep the, the whole thing sort of growing. Um, no, you can have big and you can have small. There's a place for public gathering and house to house and I think both both are required for healthy Christian life to flourish for us to be part of both we need a healthy small setting and a healthy large setting for us to flourish I think there's something uh, uh, I see both represented in the New Testament um, yeah so I think particularly when you're planting churches at a distance doing things like zoom calls with a with a with a, with a home group that used to be part of or to the whole church you know video updates you know all sorts of things just to keep people connected work hard at that um so that people always feel you know i've been sent but i've not been forgotten you know i'm i'm, I'm involved in this um how are we doing for time here um, yeah, I think we're, we've got a few minutes. So um, how does a church plant begin? Well, it can be many ways. Uh, as it, it can be someone or a couple or even a few people moving to a new town because employment has come up there. And so they open their home to reach their neighbours. And it, as I say, it just starts as a gospel community. It can be you know, just using the business even as a surface contact area with customers who you can share the gospel with. That's a great, a great way forward. It can be a group sent from a church or across a whole family of churches. It can be a team that's recruited and sent further afield. Um, sometimes it can be someone who we've formed connection with in another nation that wants to build church on the values that we're building and say, would you train me and help me so that I can build this church here in my home nation? And either they come over for a time for training or we can do training in situ while they're planting. Um, because church planting, I think, to be most effective needs to be done in the mother tongue of the nation that you're serving. And with the cultural understanding that someone from that culture will bring. Now, it doesn't mean we don't send people from one culture to another, but they've got to really immerse themselves in the culture. And they've got to learn the language and they've got to be able to communicate in the heart language. We've got numbers of churches who use lots of different languages or a number of meetings in different languages in the place they're in. But that will always be to serve the, the culture that they're in rather than because that's just a personal preference of the leaders. So um, final thing on church planting, and then we'll, we'll have some um, questions, is it is costly because it means saying goodbye to friends who are moving on 
Um, and often the church that's planted can feel somewhat bereft um, after they've planted, particularly if the church plant is going really well, because you think, goodness, what's happening here? We feel like we're just all flat now for a while. Um, there can be uh, things that go wrong for no simple reason, or it doesn't work, or it's it, it, there's unexpected developments, um, family health or difficulties or challenges we just didn't see coming. It, it, it is real spiritual warfare planting a church. Why? Because you're extending God's key um, vehicle for the gospel throughout the earth, and so it's a, it's an enemy target, and we do need to really pray for for church planting and stand behind it it does require money su support um although we you know we don't want to create dependency on the mothership as it were and i wouldn't ever set up anything like that that way now uh but nevertheless we want to help financial engines get started where people are going so there's lots and lots of yeah other things we could say about church planting i, I do think starting new families which is what i've called the session and, and what we talk about in the book is a part of healthy Christian life. So we're all involved in it individually, one way or the other, and we're involved in it as local churches because that's part of being fruitful. Um, okay, I think we'll stop there, and Jamie will have some more questions for us, I think. Yes, I do. Okay, let us start with this question here. Um, there is a lot of excitement around disciple-making movements right now. So how would you respond to someone who says we are commanded to make disciples and not plant churches? Um, well, I, I think the two things go together. I mean, I, I, I work quite a lot with uh, some very big disciple making movements, particularly in the Middle East, uh, where that that move of God is is working very strongly. So I do know it very, very closely firsthand up close. Uh, and now I think there are some remarkable strengths uh, to the disciple making movement model. Um, but I would, I, I, a verse I often use uh, is the one I, um, I used from in Romans 15, where, um, let me just find it just to make sure I say it correctly. Romans 15, where Paul writes to the Romans, and um, where are we? Oh, I'm in the, <laughs> in the wrong book. Doesn't help, does it? I wondered why it wasn't in Acts because it's not in Acts. Here we go. He said, Romans 15, 14, right. I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge and able to instruct one another. Now that's a disciple making culture. It's a disciple making movement as it were in Rome. He then says, but on some points I have written to you very boldly by way of reminder because of the grace given me by God. So what I try to say is that things that are being learned at disciple making movement level um, still require leadership, teaching, grace gifts from God to strengthen the, the organic that's happening. But I think the organic that's happening can help us, particularly in the West, learn about how to get movement because we're very good at the teaching and the structure. We're not so good at getting the movement, getting the whole thing to live. And I think the movements that I'm seeing in various parts of the world are very good at getting the movement going, but they're not always so good at the leadership and the sustainability and building healthy church life. So I think the two things can bless one another. East meets West, I think, would be a tremendous opportunity for global impact so i don't think it's either or i think god's teaching some things around the globe that both west and east if i can polarize it geographically so it tends to be the east where the disciple making movements are having the greatest impact at the moment but the west is beginning to see some things so i think as i say discipleship it's not particularly a biblical word disciples it's another word for believer so Great, thank you. Our next question is asking, what 
distinguishes what you would call a gospel community from a church plant? Like, do you have a baseline definition for what a church is? Yeah, so there would be three stages. So there's a gospel community where it's very low key, a bit like Paul in Philippi, where Lydia says, well, you know, if you consider me a believer, you can use my house. You know, it's a little gospel community, just getting going. I think when it's when it becomes a church plant, it's got a little bit more num numerical to it, but it still hasn't got an, a recognized appointed leadership. So in our family of churches, the way we do it is that we would oversee that church plant through the supply lines of sending people in and out as an accountability back to us as a team. When we think there's a recognized leadership emerging in that church and that, that the church recognizes that as well, we will then set in uh, the leadership team of that church plant. And that then is when we would call it a church. It's got its own leadership. And it could walk away from us if it wanted, because it's got its own autonomy. The local leaders are where the, the government rests once that has happened. We're no longer, we no longer have control. It's the only reason someone would stay with us is out of relationship and wanting our input because we're friends and we're, they recognize the grace like Paul there to the Romans. I myself have written to you because of the grace God has given me. So the Romans received him because they knew he had grace that they needed. So it's done very relationally. Thank you. Uh, and next question here asks, uh, when planting a church, is it important for the church planters to live within the community? Um, or is it okay for the church planter to launch and then leave? Uh, I think some of it depends on the grace gift of the church planter. We have certainly found, and this, this is observational rather than biblical, but, but observationally, the person or the, often the couple, this is often a couple or two couples or whatever, the people, say people, the people who pioneer it from naught to about, I don't know, 50 are not necessarily the right people to then take it from 50 to 100 to 200 to 300. They may have a pioneering gift that is best used at carving out of the granite from nothing. Sometimes people can start and then carry on all the way through and they've got the breadth of grace to do that. Uh, what we try and do at the beginning is set expectations because otherwise you could get a pioneering person or couple or whatever going in, getting it going. And if they don't realize they've run out of their grace, they hang on and try to just keep the thing growing and growing, but they've actually outrun their grace gift and someone else now needs to come in or emerge to take it on. And that's not a failure on their part. It's just recognizing where's their sweet spot. So it's best to really be open and honest about that up front or even say, look, we don't know. We'll assess it as we go along. But it's an open question rather than something that's never discussed. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Our next question is asking, um, hmm, is there a point when a church gets too big? Like, is there a size that's appropriate for when there should be a church plant out of that mm. church? Um, well, again, observationally, I would say that when, when a church, and this is not a new thing, I'm gonna say many people observe this, when a church gets to about 200 and it gets to the point where you, you no longer know everybody at all, then you somehow have to multiply the expression of, um, church in such a way that you keep the relational surface area intact now that might mean you just multiply congregations or meetings or small groups but often it could be done through planting more churches and then you just keep that going no i'm nothing against mega churches and thousands and thousands of believe nothing at all against that but the only way that will retain its genuine family feel if is if it's constituted in such a way as that family is perpetuated sure you can have a big family 
but it's just got to be worked at a lot harder. Um, and some do that brilliantly. Um, so I think it all depends on the grace gift, probably, of the leaders involved in a particular situation. But every, everything must be done to make sure that kind of family sense of connection is not lost. Otherwise, people are just turning up to an event. And, and that, that's, that's not church. Great, thank you. Um, so do you have a tool to assess grace gifts and how should that be done? Uh, hmm. Well, I, I mean, <laughs> it, I think that is done through process. That's all part of that's all part of raising up spiritual sons and daughters that you go with people on a journey and you see what emerges. Um, I certainly don't favor people filling in a questionnaire and then coming out with a, you know, I am a this. I mean, it can be helpful as a con confirmatory thing, I suppose, but I, I wouldn't make a choice of a church planter just because they filled in a questionnaire. I'd want, I'd, you know, it's a journey. It's a journey. Uh, so the, the 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 tools are proximity, time, process. Um, emer I, it's better for people to emerge rather than arrive. There's always problems with people who arrive, um, or usually, if people emerge, you can kind of see over time, and then you get a good fit um yeah and you can't shorten that you can't short circuit that process it's just so that's why we have to train people now for the next 30 years you just gotta it's the people in the youth group who need to have the investment now um otherwise we're just going to run out of leaders yes thank you uh our next question is asking so you said that food can be one of the most important things when um, planting a church. Hmm. So, but how vital is it to create an appropriate leadership structure when planting a new church? Well, yeah, I mean, obviously you need to raise up godly leaders who can, uh, so when Paul said to Titus, you know, st uh, stay there in Crete and uh, straighten out what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every church there, you know. Um, that wasn't what he did at the beginning. He, Paul had, you know, something was happening. There was initiative underway, and he sent Titus to straighten out what was left unfinished. So, in other words, the establishment of leadership for a church took place after the church had been going for a while, um, because it was led accountably through relationship with travelling itinerant, you know, translocal ministry, Paul and his team, etc. So, I think. Food is an amazing gathering tool. And if you don't gather people, you've got nothing to lead. So um, I think we'll just gather people first and then let leadership emerge um, in terms of plurality. You might have a pioneer leader there already who's arranged for the food to be served. <laughs> um, but, you, you know, you, you, there's got to be a, a plurality. We always, we always appoint a plurality of leaders in a church. Um, I mean, people use different systems and styles and ecclesiologies of course but that we would always look for plurality so there's multi multi-faceted gift mix in in the leadership great thank you um it looks like that is it for questions um so mike my question for you is would you honor us in closing out in uh prayer before your closing comments Sure, happy to do that. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you to everyone who's um, uh, joined us and who will uh, view us later as well. So, yeah, it's been a privilege to do this. So, let's just pray together. Father, I pray and ask, Lord, that these uh, few thoughts uh, over this afternoon or this morning or this evening, wherever people are listening and watching from, I pray that you would use them as um, seeds for kingdom fruitfulness. Lord, you say that the kingdom is like a mustard seed. 
and it looks like you know almost nothing really but when planted and and then planted by faith and left to holy spirit activity it produces um tree that has branches that even birds can sit in and i pray lord that from this little mustard seed of time together this afternoon something will grow the kingdom will do its work and that something will grow far more than we expected um there will be impacts and connections and church planting and church strengthening and healthy christian culture emerging in a way uh, that we never anticipated lord you always do more than all we ask or imagine so i pray lord that your kingdom will come and your will will be done as a result of these hours we've spent together this afternoon lord in jesus name we pray amen